Hello, everybody. Are you ready? Okay, some uh, updates. First one, T. Tomorrow. T tomorrow. <laughs> marmalade? No, no marmalade. <laughs> Uh, I have a very good news for you. Do you know that I bring good news? Uh, we were discussing about the schedule, and then we realized that as everybody is son of the earth, of God, of uh, we need to rest a little bit. Yes. And then we change it, the poster section poster session of Saturday to next Wednesday. Amen. So that you have, we are going to work on Saturday up to uh, the middle of the afternoon and then you will be free to To read everything we sent to you. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay. And then Sunday is a free day. Okay. Perhaps a sunny day too. So that we will be able to enjoy São Paulo, to know São Paulo carefully. <laughs> ask, ask guys about tips. The, the biggest one, the most important one is do not make tourist face. <laughs> This is the most important one. Okay, tourist face. <laughs> and do not use mobile yes. at the street. Yes. Never, ever. Okay, otherwise you'll never see your mobile again. <laughs> if you need to call somebody, go into the shop, a shop, and then make the, the call <laughs> inside the shop. Okay, okay, it's a joke. No, it's not a joke. <laughs> so you are now with Leopoldo. My friend, Leopoldo is going to talk about you, about something very, very important. One thing that you are going to do with yourselves, which means networks. Networks. Network. Okay? So, Leopoldo, thank you. Yourself, yeah. Thank you. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here with you to this morning, and thank you, Tuha, and all the organizers for the invitation. Uh, well, my background is uh, oceanography. I'm an oceanographer. Start, I started my career with uh, opening stomachs of fish and then uh, asking fishermen about the ecology of fish and then uh, towards uh, conservation, uh, so how, how fishers' knowledge and people's knowledge would uh, change things. Um, more recently, uh, this drive towards solutions and uh, changing behaviors drove me to governance. So uh, a lot of, of uh, the aspects of governance and uh, networks and uh, knowledge networks that I'm going to touch upon here this morning. Uh, it's based on, on personal experience on the policy frontier here in Brazil and, 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 and some international level uh, activity, but uh, also from empirical research with some of the uh, outputs of this research also um, I'm going to screen out for you this morning. So uh, good that we already started with a metaphor here, uh, that we are all so sons of God, and uh, I heard even an amen here. <laughs> that, that brings me to uh, this uh, nice picture. It's a, a beach in uh, Santa Catarina, in Florianópolis, in Moçambique. And uh, this is a uh, gira de Iemanjá. Who knows what that is? That's... Uh, that, so what is that, please? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah? Can you explain? Can I? <laughs> Let's see if my friend from uh, northern Brazil, I, I, I heard you're speaking this, these days and I'm... Well, uh, I'm from Bahia. Bahia, of course. I don't know if yeah. in Bahia we call like this, mm -hmm. but... It seems like uh, what we do February 2nd. That's no? right, perfect. That's right. So we go to the ocean and we offer to the gods, goddess of the sea, which is Imaja, um, gifts, flowers, and odd stuff, 
but not with plastic bottle. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, you, my dad doesn't look, doesn't like <laughs> waste in her house. You know, I have a friend, an NGO a friend, a colleague, Buya, Claudio Buya, in Salvador, who is working in an NGO trying to revert the practice of throwing flower plastics and um, and uh, bottles uh, in the, into the sea. So, uh, the, the th where I want to get with this is that uh, even with the most uh, and, and people here are on the their most abstract and highest prairies for health, ocean health, and their inner health. But um, if you don't uh, take into account the science and uh, the facts, and uh, you can uh, you can make disaster out of your good intentions. So, uh, science it's always uh, something that uh, should support your informed decisions into the policy domain, but of course, uh, go into the realms of abstraction, and I'm going to do a lot of abstraction here with concrete examples too, but uh, it's of uttermost importance as well. So another thing is that plastic, uh, plastic, the plastics issue, Tura knows very well, uh, is one uh, that is often dealt with uh, as a technocratic or solutions that are um, too disciplinary or too specific. It, uh, but in contrast, the, 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 thing, the plastic and other types of pollutions into the sea requires a much more holistic and systemic approach for territorial development and so forth. So it's not, not a, just about not throwing plastic in rituals, but uh, it requires systemic thinking and practice. So uh, this is a good example to start off uh, our analysis. So uh, I want to address this uh, issue of the waking times of transdisciplinary ocean science and that's a question actually. Is it uh, the waking times for uh, this type of research that uh, engages with uh, social actors and uh, with different perspectives and so forth? So what's the stuff that drives this type of uh, uh, this type of research, uh, and you know very well that you, uh, the, the advocacy and policy and often transdisciplinary research requires meeting with people, uh, organizing uh, structured dialogues, and um, uh, in, re in reality, uh, it's different from what we're seeing here, uh, where we have a right now a unilateral transfer of information from me to you, but when you're in real life, things are not uh, uh, very linear and uh, cause effect. And at logics, it's uh, uh, quite often problematic to deal with the turbulence that, uh, especially if you're dealing with social movements that have a lot of emotion involved. So uh, this is one important thing to keep in mind, but we are always trying with these networking events or encounters, trying to uh, reach a common ground and uh, find out coordination between ourselves and our families and our peers, whatever they are. Um, also, uh, trying to uh, get out of this short-termism in terms of, okay, let's write a project and then there you go there, but you hit somewhere, you don't know where exactly you're hitting off. But you're trying to go towards a more uh, systemic, long way try type of collaborations and partnerships that can really affect change in, the, in, in reality. Uh, also dealing with some problems or uh, not really problems, this is just part of human existence that uh, trusts and uh, sometimes I don't even trust myself in some circumstances. <laughs> Everybody should uh, be aware that uh, the, the, the working networks also you're dealing with a lot of uh, subjectivities, intersubjectivities that uh, it's good that you are aware of, uh, uh, if not conscious, but aware of uh, that this is, this is happening. Uh, but even though we are connected uh, through w with ourselves and remotely, um, there's a lot of fragmentation as well in the, in the knowledge uh, networks that uh, we engage with. And uh, of course, to understand and to interact in this field of policy, you have to know that people have different ways of uh, framing and understanding the planet and, uh, uh, and, and life in the planet. So people uh, such as uh, fisher folk are much more uh, into letting their lives 
happen with the tides, uh, with the, the rhythm of shoals and uh, the winds and so forth. But people, the marinocrats, I, I, I want to craft that term now because uh, long t uh, a lot of time working with marinocrats marine crats in uh, Brasilia. Uh, they does uh, see into uh, paperwork or legal terms very specific, uh, specific and uh, sometimes, most of the times, very structured conversations and formal conversations. That's uh, what we have. But so to navigate, to be a spider, to connect people, to cross uh, identity bounder, boundaries, you have to understand that uh, you're dealing with uh, businessmen's logics that have uh, privileges, private interests, or sciences that are uh, very, um, uh, some very um, focused on specific issues for a lot of time and don't want to be responsible for what their uh, the, the, the research, uh, the application of their research, uh, and also uh, fisher folk uh, with all the world views that invades and the lobbyists, so forth. So you have to circulate and, and have uh, that framing in your mind to, to be able to identify that framing, the diversity of understanding, and to behave yourself in uh, action situations. But of course, um, uh, you. Um, you find that uh, uh, the, the many stakeholder groups are less powerful. There are a lot of asymmetries. Uh, uh, and for instance, uh, the artisanal fisheries are uh, worldwide, uh, small scale fisheries are the, the, the big, the big um, numbers in terms of people involved, but in terms of power, uh, of course, the industrial fisheries. And uh, so y y you also would like to um, be sensitive to the social inequalities, social injustices that uh, is driving your career. Um, of course, uh, in order to do that, you need to find the novel ways of communicating with people. Uh, be it through social media, uh, information technologies, or even artistic expression. Or, there are many, many ways that you can convey an idea, and you don't need always to be very, um, very structured and very formal. And uh, Tuha is teaching me that very well, that you can be a great scientist without, and be also fluid and be uh, light uh, and use Metaphors, metaphor. I love metaphors. And uh, when we talk about metaphors, we're not talking about inductive or empirical uh, research or deductive research. It's a different type of logics. Uh, we call it abduction, uh, which is the lateral extension of abstract components of descriptions. What the heck is that? So seeing the world as a jazz band, for instance, uh, can you do that? Uh, or or uh, things are just happening. People are adapting themselves. It's an open process. So this is to face reality is to be connected to, uh, to what is going on. Uh, and uh, have, having this conscious understanding that you are a networker and you are connecting people through your, through your conversation, through your, through your paper, papers as well. Uh, so uh, are you playing the drums? Uh, in Brazil, we have the saying that people in the policy frontier who plays the drums uh, is giving the rhythm to, to, the, to the team uh, to, uh, to, to interact and to go to some roo room or uh, <laughs> to deliver a policy brief, to, to address someone in the elevator, as it was mentioned uh, this uh, couple of days. Or, or are you just background noise in this uh, musical world that we're living in? So this is the type of... Uh, issue that I want to address in this talk. Uh, so knowledge networks, let's be more specific on the terms. The combinations of pe persons or organizations usually dispersed geographically, sharing commu technologies, uh, emphasizing the creation of joint uh, value. Leandra spoke about uh, epistemic communities, a different uh, framing for the kind of the similar phenomena that we're dealing with. Uh, strengthening mutual research and communication capacities, mobilizing, engaging decision makers more directly through tran transfer of, tech, uh, of knowledge into policy and practice. So uh, this is uh, uh, an orchestration, another nice, uh, love this um, uh, 
concept from political science, which is also kind of the, the maestro uh, of different organizations uh, uh, doing agenda setting, so through uh, bringing new ideas into the process, ideational support would be um, working with uh, like um, uh, ideas. Uh, let's 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 make this process towards ecosystem based or it's a principle based policy process that is going to value justice or, or some other uh, value that you, you want to promote in a certain field of policy. And also material support, uh, technologies and so forth. So orchestrators are organ organizations that are uh, neat. Uh, they don't have a lot of resources that work to with second, uh, second or with uh, indirectly through influencing different organizations to do their work directly. Uh, so, uh, uh, so let's stick to the, the metaphor, the, plan, the, the musical metaphor. Some, I'm not sure why it's not uh, screening. But it says Planning Blues, it's a paper published early this year, uh, talking about what is going on in, uh, in Brazil generally, but more specific in Santa Catarina, where I work, um, in Babitonga Bay. It's uh, um, where the, a very fragmented licensing process of ports, new ports, so we have um, uh, six different ports, uh, being, in, being licensed in the, in the region, uh, where you have uh, the Pontoporia, the Vaquitas, uh, very critically endangered cetacean species, um, different birds, and you can see the last thousand most mangrove ecosystems in the whole Atlantic. Uh, in 2013, there was an oil spill. This ship just uh, sank and uh, there was a fine, uh, 9 million reais fine, that was uh, invested in different environmental projects. So uh, the problem goes, uh, this, this is a map uh, produced out of 19 workshops with fishers. So we had the map, use, where, where are the use of each community? Yes, sure. This is uh, uh, nor in the northern part of Santa Catarina coast, uh, near Joinville, the, 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 the metropolis of jo Joinville, the largest city. Uh, Joinville, do you have a point, pointer here? Yeah, so Joinville is around here. We have San Francisco do Sul, Itapuá. That, that's a friend from Itapuá here. So <laughs> uh, the, the area in the heat map here shows the overlap of use of all, all fishing communities. And you see, this is the most valuable territory here. It's a fishing territory, traditional fishing territory, which is used by many different municipalities. So you have a port, a mega shipyard being licensed here by state uh, environmental organization. Uh, here, another two ports being licensed by the state, this one of Santa Catarina, and is at the federal level, so you have different levels of licensing organizations, one at the federal level, one at the state level, at the same neighborhood, some, some uh, irrational <laughs> type of, of planning. And you have another expansion of a port here, the public port here, and another, another private port already authorized here. So, um, and they don't, they don't talk to each other this licenses process. So you do your analysis of impact and the same company, the same consultancy company which is doing the analysis of the, the next door port do not use the analysis of the other ports to do synergic uh, analysis, uh, cumulative impact analysis, multiple stressors and so forth. So um, this is very rational I think. And so th that's why it's a blues story. It's a, it's a sad story uh, to tell. And this is uh, happening uh, worldwide. The ocean grabbing, it's a very critical issue worldwide where private interests are driving uh, very fast, more fast than the governance system is able to prepare itself to deal with this phenomenon. Uh, it's a very profound and very 
hypocritical, irrational. So uh, lobbyists and private interests works in the shadows of this irrationality. And uh, it's a lot of speculation. You don't have a clue what is going to happen. And uh, it's an uh, ideal, optimal uh, atmosphere for bargaining, for lobbyists, and so forth, and so forth. So uh, this is currently happening. Um, so, but we have Babitonga Achieva project, which is, um, let me just see for a second if I can, um, if I can put the whole slide in the frame here. Is it, it's better? A little bit. When we use a different technology, we face those risks, no problem. No, I think we can go. Yeah. So Babitonga Tiva project, you can go to the website and see more details, is trying to deal with this pathology, with this, uh, using the, the therapeutic, the, the, the medical metaphor, the pathology. Um, and uh, the, how, how error-based governance strategies usually, uh, thank you, usually uh, happens in Brazil, let's say, for instance, to, to set up a marine protected area. Usually, this is what happens. You have, you have some interest coming from uh, uh, some conservationists or uh, some high-level officer that have a brilliant idea, and he runs some uh, diagnostics of uh, fauna, flora, and so forth, and so forth. And then you have public hearings, and then you have the designation of the protected area after a major political uh, effort sometimes, but very top-down uh, designations uh, of protected areas of, of, and frameworks. Then a lot of time uh, until uh, one public server is assigned to this, this, uh, this area. And uh, then you start implementation. It takes, sometimes it takes 20 years for a management plan to be des designated to this uh, protected area in Brazil. So, uh, creation of management council. Sometimes it takes even longer for the, for, for the uh, social fuel to, to start uh, <laughs> happening, uh, to start operating in this particular uh, marine protected area. But what we are trying to do, or what we are doing in, in Santa Catarina, it's kind of out of the box. It falls into the other effective area-based conservation strategies. It's not a M MPA, uh, and it's not a no take reserve or whatever, uh, but it is an area-based uh, strategy to improve governability, ecosystemic governability. So wh wh what are we doing there? Uh, for instance, uh, integrated diagnostics, uh, so uh, 39 workshops with different res direct resource users were conducted to have those maps that I just uh, showed you, one, one of them. Uh, creation of collaboration networks. We held uh, eco-citizenship courses for uh, community leaders and teachers in high schools in every one of the six municipality to talk about. It was a 100-hour course on you know, eco-citizenship. So very practical to understand what are the, the public spaces for uh, participation at the various levels in the municipalities and so forth, but also bringing them together after this to kind of say, well, we have a same, we have a common backyard, which is the Babitonga Bay, and we have to work together. Uh, and the creation of a multi-actor platform to take care of this unity of this ecosystem. Uh, a, a voluntary based uh, uh, council, by the way. And then we are uh, doing polycentric scenario analysis and planning. So uh, it's not one, there is not one way of doing a right policy. You can work with instruments for, for water basin management, for instance, but you can also engage with coastal zone, integrated coastal zone management policies. You have protected area policies as well, biodiversity conservation policies, so you're not going with one particular, but analyzing what's the best you can do with uh, the suite of tools that you have. So uh, there, is not, um, there, is not, there is no mandate for this group official 
published in the in the uh, published by a, a decree or something. But the group is uh, right now uh, assessing uh, this this and f and producing a financial mechanism as well with the rest of the fine. It was nine million. Now we have five million that we are trying to uh, make it uh, durable, uh, endurable, uh, investing in some fund and then uh, using the the interest to. Um, to, to support the secretary, secretary of the process and so forth. So you have to be, think of the, of the, the box, because if you wait for government to, uh, to bring uh, or to designate a protected area or to, to come and do things, so you wait forever. Luckily, we have the public ministry in our side here. So uh, this is the, the group in the second mandate already. Uh, you have fishers, you have uh, aquacultures, you have people from, from the, the municipalities that are here uh, from the public sector at the various levels and the representation and so forth. So just, just an example of how you can orchestrate uh, a, a huge number of, of actors in a, a few, uh, not a long time to, to, to increase governability. You don't need to wait things to happen. That's the me message, I suppose. So Leandra already uh, spoke about uh, the Anthropocene. And I like also the, the notion of uh, the great acceleration. So what is, what class of phenomena is this Anthropocene thing that people are trying to define when it starts? Um, a lot of people, and I, I, I buy into that, think that uh, the Anthropocene it's, it started a signal. It's uh, around the 50s, where you have many, many uh, areas of, or, uh, of natural processes uh, on, on this exponential growth. So, um, but I see human processes as natural processes as well. Of course, uh, the boundary is very blurred. Uh, right now in the, for human, humankind. We are kind of looking at the mirror and saying, okay, <laughs> oops, wh where are we going now? What do we need to do? Uh, so uh, I'm going to explore this, this phenomena and uh, particularly the, hundred, the, the last hundred, 120 years, what's going on in terms of ideas. Because we've, we've been told many and many times here as, as early career researchers that the responsibility is on us, right? <laughs> and uh, and th that the earlier generation did not knew about the, the phenomena, the, the, the crisis, something like this. So this is uh, something that I want to ch uh, challenge with, with this slide. So we have action research, which is basically uh, uh, a comparative research on the conditions and effects of very forms of social action and research leading to social action that uses a spiral of steps, each of which is composed of a circle of planning, action, fact-finding about the result of the action itself. So, and we are talking about this in the 40s, Kurt Levin, the 40s, so it's not new already here, before the great acceleration. So. Wicked problems, uh, problems that you cannot define collectively. It's very hard, constitutional problems, historical, um, cultural, ethical, whatever. They're very difficult to deal with, Dif to frame, and then to track progress towards solution. Uh, already, Hito and Weber brought into planning theory long time ago in the, 70s, in the 60s, uh, already here. See, things are getting worse. And then post-normal science, uh, I think it was uh, Pedro Jacobi who mentioned yesterday about post-normal science, that science that have to deal with complexity, with uncertainty, where the, the stakes are very high and uh, expectations and perspectives are difficult to reconcile. So that's, that's the reality of the phenomenon that we are seeing here already in the 70s with post-normal post uh, science. So, um, we, we are realizing that in order to deal with this, something like the great dialogue and partnerships are required in, 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 in uh, levels that haven't been experienced perhaps by uh, the, uh, the more experienced generation, let's put it in these words. Um, the safe, uh, the, the multi-directional information 
process where knowledge producers and knowledge users uh, are, is, are everyone. So it's not the one way of science produced knowledge and then you put up a paper or policy brief and then you communicate and you have to improve the way that you show your idea to society. This one way direction of uh, information has to be challenged and is being challenged. So everyone produces and uses knowledge. You have concepts such as citizen scientists, scientists citizen, citizen scientists, for instance, where everyone can be collect data and interpret data and so forth. So these identities are being questioned, even within the academic realm. Safe, safe operating spaces, you have... Um, who showed, uh, Leander showed the safe operating spaces, Rockstrom's uh, uh, hexagon, where we have uh, in the center where it's safe for us, the Holocene state, for instance, um, and, but also the safe operating space for disciplinary scientists. We are very safe within our, our boxes. So how can you also, we also break uh, into this uh, false uh, idea of safeness? that uh, keeps us in the, in the wrong direction. Um, we will need radically different institutions, academic organizations, knowledge producer, producing organizations. Uh, there are many colleagues of us from the Earth System Governance Network, international project, that are DRISEC, for instance, Questions. We, we need to radically reinvent how we go by doing partnerships, new modes of collaborations and so forth. Um, we have also some uh, interesting syndromes happening in this, in this uh, area here. The shifting ecological baseline syndrome. Have anyone crossed that term? Anyone? Daniel Pauli? Yeah, in 95, he brought this idea of shifting ecological baseline. So as the generation uh, goes towards the, the next one, the, and, and, and the system is it's deteriorated, the youngsters are seeing a different environment. And uh, when you see, you, you think that is the way things are. You become accustomed. This, this, this syndrome was identified by him, not in fishers, but many people are, are showing that this happens with fishers. Like uh, young, younger fishers are less likely to support more bold conservation strategies because they don't think that there is a problem right there. But so the, the baseline for your understanding, it, it's, it, it's all messed up. Local knowledge, everywhere, many places are, uh, are having difficulty to adapt to this changing uh, environment. Uh, uh, Daniel Pauli identified in fisheries biologists, isn't it? J Jake, Jake, I think, had to go to a meeting, but uh, also... Pauli is certainly a well-known fisheries biologist, strength economist. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So yeah, this, this phenomenon was uh, uh, where uh, fisheries biologists, the models were run with uh, variables, with parameters that uh, did not uh, reflect the real uh, mortality in a pristine population, for instance. Uh, uh, very problematic for our science as well. So uh, an intergenerational justice that we're barely touching on this term here. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, of course. There are different, uh, different, uh, we know, we know very well about the, the yeah, we have uh, different uh, ways of framing problems. People within academia frame, frame the issue in different ways. So it's natural. The, uh, and diversity of opinion conflicts propels innovations um, many times. Uh, so the interdiscipline, the, the inter intergenerational dialogue that we're talking about. Uh, yeah, okay, the responsibility is ours to do this, all, all of this complexity. But uh, if, you combine, if you combine two disciplines in your dissertation, you can expect to earn less than you would otherwise if in the year after finishing your doctorate, study finds. This is in 2013. And then interdisciplinary research, why it's seen as a risky route in 2004. <laughs> yeah, that's how we feel, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> isn't it, Leandro? <laughs> so, 
Yeah, anyone wants to share? I think many of you have shared your experience uh, this couple of days. We can talk more about that. But is it suicide? It's a nice paper here uh, addressing some of these issues that you might find it interesting. So an introduction to achieving policy impact for early career researchers. It has just been published a couple of weeks ago and it addresses several uh, very in important uh, issues in uh, career development. Uh, like uh, know what the policy process is and why, who is involved, knowing people, the networks, um, build and maintain your public profile, Con, uh, actively contribute to policy discussions, whatever area and domain you are. You have March of Science just um, boomed last year. So many, many scientists are, work, are, are marching right now. Parts of Science, this uh, very nice idea. So go out and, uh, uh, and, and engage. So um, relationships, networks, and mentors be engaged in these internships, fellowships, other science opportu policy opportunities that are out there, personal attributes that are uh, worth uh, fomenting, honesty, humility, openness, resilience, and so forth. So, um, wait, wait, uh, oops, I'm wrong slide. Yeah, this is the last on the section. So you would also like to visit this website, the Early Career Researchers Network of Networks. It's an, uh, it's, uh, an informal organization that uh, joins representatives of different major science projects in the planet. I am part of our system governance as well as Leandra. So, uh, so uh, if you are into one of those, you can already subscribe and be part and engage in some activities, organizing events, sometimes going to in-person meetings and so forth and talking about a career and uh, how to make an impact, especially on the sustainability sciences. There. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, an emerging network um, and you're welcome to try out. So. So is it waking times? I think the times have been a, a, the perception of the need for this transdisciplinary stuff here uh, has been there for ages. Um, so now we've seen like Belmont Forum and other major funders uh, finally putting up our calls f that are more research action oriented. That is very good, but it, it's, it, it's very still very competitive and difficult to get into this. Um, uh, into the, getting one of these uh, uh, calls, funding calls. We know very well, <laughs> isn't it, Leandra? Uh, but uh, let's see if in the next calls of future Belmont Forum, there, there are more roles for early career researchers to, to be also the leaders of projects, PIs and so forth. So that's uh, something that we are arguing in the early career network there. So let's use another metaphor. Uh, to address the problem of the networks now. Um, the therapeutic metaphor, uh, ocean health, we talk about diagnostics, prognostics. Uh, uh, each and every one discipline, frames, have the preferred variables that are important to describe the phenomena, to analyze, to explain phenomena. So uh, this uh, abduction that I'm doing now, uh, uh, highlights that uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult process to finding a common ground, a common language, a common framework. This, is, this underpins science making a lot of the times, especially interdisciplinary science. You have, for instance, Ostrom's work, Eleanor Ostrom's, he, she uses the therapeutic metaphor explicitly. So you are a medical and you're looking and you're doing the, the checking the exams that you have and you, you your mind is kind of working to, to identify where is the problem uh, so the, in, in Brazil there is this uh, uh, old the, the same unknown author it's a slang or a phrase that is uh, often pronounced in hospitals corridors which I think I can abduce to our discussion here so clinics are sovereign one does not treat the exam, but the patient. This is so obvious for those that are in the hospital. But for us, what does it mean? What, what does it mean? Uh, aren't we 
overly focused on the paper as the end result of our contribution to society? Uh, uh, or should we pay more attention to one specific phase in the diagnostic process, which is the anamnesis, where you look at the phenomena, where you engage with reality, with, uh, with the meetings, with policy processes. This is reality. So you can write about it, you can analyze, of course, but uh, you must get in touch and be open for this jazz band that is playing out there. Uh, uh, I like blues as well, but uh, that's, uh, that's not the metaphor, I like the musical. But uh, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of musics that are out of tune out there, and, and so we can go using the, this metaphor in many different ways. Uh, so, di in a nutshell, disciplinary diagnostics uh, are specialized and fo focused on narrow components of, of context, uh, focused on, uh, on scientific outputs through individualistic approaches. They can lead to fragmented policies and even reduce resilience. Uh, if you work uh, if your goal is to promote resilience of, let's say, only water in a community, the community being able to cope with disturbances related to water, you can ignore other important things that will bite your back at the end of the, of the day. <laughs> so, uh, uh, disciplinary, overly, overly specific research can lead to a pathology, which is well described by Holling, Buzz Holling, uh, as a pathology in natural resource management. Um, a mismatch between prescriptions and the evolution of pathology. As I say, the process of producing a paper is not connected most of the times to the, the phenomenon, the, the, the patient that is out there. So transdisciplinary diagnostic, diagnostic on turn, it's generalistic understanding of context and open to emergent patterns focus on knowledge building process by generalists or teams of experts. You can be an expert, but uh, you're part of a team. Uh, experiential as well as experimental social learning. Experiential because you experience, you learn yourself through uh, engaging with these activities, uh, but also experimental because then you need social uh, scientists to come and give structure to this process, identify learning points uh, and be reflexive on, on actions and, and be able to maximize social learning in various ways. Um, there are more room for humanities, uh, art, arts process, people that uh, uh, work with different approaches, uh, audiovisual, media and so forth. Um, and Consiliency, consilience leading to policy co coherence. So the, you, you, we are very familiar with the concept of science. Uh, and there's another related concept, which is consilience. It's the coming together, the, the u unif unification of different uh, inferences uh, that comes from different uh, ways of thinking or ways of framing a particular problem. So consilience is like the, 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 the unity uh, of understanding where, where you have when you have a very uh, nice group working with respect uh, for, the, for the speech of others and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so creating a welcoming space for conflict mediation. So um, this, this type of diagnostics you can uh, welcome conflict. Conflicts are not to put under the carpet. Uh, sometimes it's very important that conflict emerges, but it emerges in a welcoming environment. You know? uh, so um, it's also a benefit for this approach. Okay, so uh, I think enough of uh, this. I just want to map different areas of, of application of, 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 of science and to policy. Now we're going to a more concrete um, study case. Let's see how much time I have left for. 40? Okay. There will be time for a nice discussion then. This is a, this is a paper where we applied the metaphor but also uh, undertook empirical inductive research using models for uh, analyzing uh, the network, ocean network domain of Brazil. Uh, so 
Leander is a co-author uh, and uh, many friends from Brazil and elsewhere. It a, was a very collaborative uh, piece of work. It's published in Frontiers of Mar in Marine Science. Um, you can have a look and go into the details also of things that I've mentioned in the previous, previous slides. So, Healing Brazil, Blue Amazon with Knowledge actor, act Networks. So, why Blue Amazon? There's a law here that the, the military have uh, advocated for. Um, uh, it was published, uh, that, so the day of the Blue Amazon is 16 of November. They want to, to associate the image of the EEZ, the Econo Exclusive Economic Zone of Brazil, which is the eighth in the planet, very, very big chunk of ocean in the South Atlantic, with the Amazon. I don't think personally it's a good metaphor because I think the, our ocean stands on its own legs, but it's, uh, it's law. And it's also a, 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 um, a way of, of, of criticizing the military many times. So this is the Blue Amazon. So, so we have here. 4.4 million kilometer squares. Brazil has somewhat about over 300 coastal municipalities, uh, 17 coastal states. So you can imagine the, the difficulty which is to, to create uh, structures to govern pa uh, instruments that can be applied and replicate, replicated in every single unit of governance across the coast, but even more if you go uh, out uh, to, the, to the continental shelf, the extension of the continental shelf, so it's a huge task uh, to, to, to govern this, this uh, huge area. So the paper, uh, the highlights of the paper, uh, of course we saw that the Anthropocene compels the unlocking of ocean-related network capabilities because we're not we are not going to, to solve the problems of the Amazon uh, with uh, disciplinary mindsets. Uh, you need to unlock the capacities, which are already out there in several work groups, teams, laboratories, and so forth. We have, as humans, the capacity to solve the problem, but we have to put things on the move many, many times. Uh, so this, this is the... the, the uh, how I see that we are compelled to do this, we should do this, and uh, uh, we should. Orchestration of local, regional, and global knowledge networks can augment transformative capacity. So, um, this is also something that we uh, believe, but it's, it's a premise, but uh, also it has been shown by this work that is, this is the case for Brazil as well. Uh, if we can connect the science with the action. And we will see this uh, just uh, in a few slides. Transdisciplinary network diagnostics are promising social learning tools, as we've already addressed, uh, but, uh, and strategic advice for transformational research in ocean territories are provided. So we use in inductive research models to crack out the complexity and to see where are the maneuver points that we can work as, a, as teams, as networks, to promote a regime shift, regime shift from fragmented ocean governance, sectorial, towards integrated ecosystem base. So uh, there are different regimes. You, you can envision this, uh, this alternative regime and you can uh, as, as teams, as groups of networks, work and understand this field to try to tip the system to the, this other state. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we are talking about with this paper here. So the paper addressed uh, this question. So what is needed to build a socially and ecologically coherent network of marine protected areas in the broadest sense of the term, as core aspects of marine spatial planning processes for the entire exclusive economic zone, but also ecosystem-based marine spatial planning. 
that uh, partially brought by the existence of MPAs. But uh, so w th that's the vision that we need, uh, we pose as authors, uh, uh, to, to seek, to pursue. So um, people in the political sciences and in conservation circles always uh, talk about top-down approaches or uh, where governments uh, of, uh, usually create with not much dialogue and that causes a lot of conflicts uh, that uh, perdure during the uh, life, the implementation life of a given uh, instrument, in our case MPAs for instance, marine protected areas. Uh, or people talk about the need f to devolve power, to decentralize and uh, be more community based or bottom up uh, way of uh, doing policy and, uh, and, uh, and, and a way that science can inform policy towards that goal. But in fact, uh, re it's not that simple. In fact, um, uh, a different view that we uh, are thinking and agreeing with, the, with John, Peter Johns, for instance, is the uh, polycentric, co-evolutionary, hierarchical governance context for Brazil in this, in this case. Polycentric because it has many centers of power and authority, agents doing uh, their work, their stuff on different levels, uh, but also a decentralizing process. The polycentrism is also promoting uh, decentralization. Uh, but it needs hierarchy because you need strategic goals. You need to have overall, overall understanding and directions for a region, for, uh, for, for a really large chunk of ocean in our case. It's not hierarchical in terms of uh, power relationships, but hierarchical in terms of structure. That you, you need some uh, guidance from above, but uh, some information that uh, is uh, that is agreed upon and is science based and so forth. So co-evolutionary because uh, these processes here, for instance, councils, management bodies, and so forth, they are interacting with each other. They are learning from each other, uh, and you can find ways to uh, boost learning and boost co-evolution. Uh, solutions emerge somewhere. Uh, MS 270 or 300 coastal municipalities that you can transfer to, to different uh, territories. So this is what is shown here. You have co-evolution within a given territory but also across boundaries, across seascape levels. Uh, and uh, you have from the bottom, you could imagine, uh, it's, uh, participation and institutional learning processes, but also you need negotiated compliance for structure, for hierarchic uh, strategies. So you, ha you need authority uh, to, in order to th get things moving. So it's a much more complex. It's not just simply top-down versus bottom-up or economic, working through economic incentives, as many people say. Uh, this, I think this image reflects more very well the reality. So what we did with this paper was to analyze uh, three, three uh, case studies. One was at the national level, the B hypothesis here. Well, how, how is this governance, ocean governance structure, regime at the national level? What are the opportunities for change? But we also uh, investigated two uh, very nearby systems, one in Babitonga Bay, uh, the, the case that I just uh, presented to you, and another one in uh, Baleia Franca, the Southern Right Whale Environmental Protection Area in Santa Catarina as well. So they are uh, related to each other. Okay. Okay. And then we used the uh, heuristics uh, Christiana Seixas introduced to us yesterday the panarchic, uh, panarchy heuristics where you have uh, the adaptive cycle loops uh, interrelated with different le levels. Uh, so you have um, uh, the exploration phase where the system is building itself up, connecting, finding new ways, the exploration phase, which is 
also referred to as transparent to opaque, as it was cloudy, so it's getting more structure, more cloudy in this sense. But uh, often there is something that happens that the system collapse, and many times if, there is, if it's resilient, uh, it continues on the same trajectory. So from opaque to hazy, the system breaks down and comes back to, to its own route, or it can be flipped towards another regime. That's what we're thinking, the, the, the rationale I introduced to you. So we have, at the blue Amazon level, our analysis showed that we are more or less here, sitting at a, 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 conserva a conservative stage, uh, but fragmented and sectoral. Uh, at Babitonga ecosystem, we are, as, as I showed, we, we, without government, we, flip, we are flipping the system. People already realize things cannot continue as they are. Public authorities on the ground are saying that too. So, uh, so the conjuncture, political conjuncture, and the possibilities you have sitting in every different uh, place in this model uh, affects your opportunities, uh, affects what institutional or entrepreneurship you can do, st uh, policy strategies, action, types of agents that are needed. So the theory, uh, which is uh, from Wesley et al., uh, Frances Wesley, she's a brilliant uh, researcher, uh, I think in the UK, if not or Canada, I'm not sure, but they came together to propose this, uh, this model for, uh, it's a theory of transformative agency. So you analyze the context, your problem domain, and you find the opportunity contexts. That's what we're talking about. So the opportunity contexts here uh, in the blue Amazon, the, the national level, is as follows. So before I go, move next, we have the Southern Right Whale Environmental Protection Area in South of Brazil, which was endorsed by the federal government as a pilot project for a new type of management plan, or building a management plan, one that is more uh, focused on, on, on transdisciplinary diagnostics involving the actors to, to, to understand the uses and uh, so forth. Um, instead of disciplinary, those huge diagnostic pieces of work that you describe the fauna exhaustively or you describe the oceanography exhaustively. Uh, we, don't know, we don't need that level of, of, of detail to get things moving. That's the idea. Not that we don't need, and don't get me wrong, but uh, they are testing a new model for that could be replicated to other marine protected areas in Brazil if it's successful. So, but I will focus on the blue Amazon level for the time being now. So the theory, uh, our hypothesis uh, within this model is that uh, we are on, in an opaque, too hazy. The government is, is giving si signals that wants to change, or at least recognize, acknowledge that it wants to change. There are working groups within government that are reflecting about how to do the step zero, the, uh, the pre-planning phase of the marine special planning for the whole country. And they are for four years or five years now convening to, to propose, come up to the table and say, okay, that's how we will do it. So there are opportunities. Brazil also proposed a volunteer commitment at the last year's New York uh, conference on oceans uh, that will support marine spatial planning, ecosystem-based planning, and so forth. So there are, on the discourse level, uh, opportunities. And um, we are ourselves, myself and Alexander Tuha, informing or acting as uh, assessors for this working group. Uh, so we're kind of uh, optimism, opt not so much optimistic, but <laughs> persistent <laughs> on, on our approaches to the, to, to, to the Navy uh, and other ministries that are involved in this working group. It's called Grupo de Trabalho de Uso Compartilhado do Ambiente Marinho, Shared Use of Marine Space. Brazil wants to invent a new term. It's not marine spatial planning. It's shared use of the marine space. <laughs> so uh, it's basically the same. Um, 
we are on the conservation to release. In order to release and we look for other regime to shift, uh, what can we do? So the system is releasing results for innovation. There are signals. Dominance of old institutions and premises st still operates because if the national level is fragmented, uh, the, all other subnational cases such as Babitong and others are still operating uh, in a fuzzy way or irrationally as, a, as we saw, saw it. Uh, so we are sitting on the conservative. The only signals that we can move towards another system. But as, as I say, it's small pockets of and support to ongoing innovations are out there. How can we explore this opportunity context? That's what the theory proposed. So this is just um, uh, the, uh, the application of the theory, the, uh, the prescriptive uh, recommendations. So proposed institutional entrepreneur strategies. So you need to stimulate the release of resources and lower the, the resilience of the dominant regime. We, we need to convene activities such as sense making, sense giving to support collective action, uh, encourage stakeholder participation, of course, uh, very important, resource mobilization through sense making and convening. So this orchestration hole that we're trying to achieve. Skills and, ac and actions that are needed. We, a lot of cultural skills like visioning uh, kind of process, uh, marketing ideas, framing, the, motivating, defining the problem, bringing it to, 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 to clarity, shedding light, um, enabling collective attributions. Uh, types of agents, we need knowledge carriers and stewards, sense makers, interpreters, visionaries, inspirers. So it seems very broad and it is. So how, to, how to translate that, the theoretical application, into, into Real action. <laughs> it's a, it's a, the, perhaps the first application of this theory at, the, at this sort of regional level. We are still struggling to see how that will turn into, how that will inspire our activities within the networks that we are engaged. But let's see if we can uh, kind of s scope through the, the, so the solution or the answer for that. So now I'm going to, uh, 20 minutes more or less. I'm going to go faster. Uh, in 2012, we had uh, Rio Plus 20, uh, the future we want, high level discussions in one side of the town. In the other side of the town, the city of Rio de Janeiro, we had the People's Summit uh, with uh, more than 800 self governed activities where civil society got together to discuss problems out of the box, play drums as well, do party, but do serious stuff as well. And there uh, was born the ombudsperson of the C network, which Mariana is part of. Uh, and uh, we held one of the self governed activities, a kind of a hub in the city of, of Rio de Janeiro that we could identify ourselves, go there and say, okay, there will be a place where you can find ocean people. Because there was, in one week, over 50 related events related to ocean. So we wanted this hub to occur. And in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, the, the, we had this innovative Rio Dialogues, and one specially on oceans, uh, uh, that happened on the 19th of June of 2012. But the future we want later was finalized in the 18th, so there was no influence of this dialogue in the letter of future we want itself, and neither influence of the bottom-up process in the, in the real dialogues and in the future we want. Very fragmented landscape also of policy in Rio de Janeiro we found. This was the real dialogues. You have a silver Earl here and many other famous folks. Um, oops. Yeah. So this is the, was the march that we held. We were just below here in this globe. If you remember on the television, New York Times, our globe was there. It was us uh, carrying the, the big ball, big blue ball. Yeah, Mariana is here, isn't it? Where, is it? Where are you here? Let me see. Yeah, she, yeah I think she, this is Mariana. <laughs> so in the Rio de Janeiro during the People's Summit, Rio Plus 20. So it was an important event, emotionally, too, to get connected to people. 
And that drove many interactions that followed in the past six years. So uh, another uh, thing that happened in 2014 here at the Oceanographic Institute to be in partnership with uh, the Kiel University, the cluster of future, future ocean cluster of uh, we held uh, a sign from Science to Society, the Future Ocean Dialogue, with uh, a round discussion about the interface of so ocean to policy, science to policy. So what are, were the networks? We did this mapping process of identifying what are the networks, the problems that we face in the science, uh, the policy, science policy gaps, and how to improve responsiveness. Uh, and information in this fragmented field, uh, envisioning process. And then in 2015, that process in, here in USP informed the launching of the Brazilian Future Ocean Panel, uh, which has a mission to perform as a multi-sectorial collaborative platform of individuals and organizations on the interface of knowledge and decision-making processes aiming at qualifying policies for the sustainable use and health of the oceans. The, uh, the documents, the zero draft was launched, so the guidance was given, and uh, uh, in 2016, uh, the Mbuds person of the network, of the sea, the other network that was formed, and a fisheries, small scale fisheries network, convened here, there in Brasilia to undertake the first self diagnostic process of networks in Brazil. So it was a team of 15 or 20 young fellows that got together, designed a survey, online survey with social. Uh, social network information when we circulate broadly with emails, social media, and many representatives of different networks uh, uh, filled, the, the, filled the, the questionnaire and we produced collectively a collaborative editorial process, a report, a self-diagnostic. How, how is this field of networks in Brazil? So in the, in the right, in the, in the left here, we have one output. It's a structurally explicit visualization of the network. Uh, we have some organizations that are more connected to others. So the basic question was uh, with whom you interacted, your network interacted on a network level uh, with others in the past two years. So this is uh, uh, the mind map. So what, some of these networks out on the outskirts, uh, for instance, a uh, uh, law of the, law of the sea, uh, Love the sea networks of lawyers working with oceans in Brasilia were very apart from the group, and then we, as a self, as, as a network, worked ever since to bring them closer. So th this is uh, how, how 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 it goes. And the Brazilian Future Ocean Panel, we have uh, now the Brazilian Oceanic Horizon. It's a program. So you have the strategic. Uh, document that was launched in 2015 and now we are going to action uh, finally uh, so we have the march march people, scientists here marching uh, and many organizations so but this self network diagnostic was only uh, uh, engaged with civil society organizations and we, it was over 40 organizations mapped working and producing knowledge about very significant ocean issues so ever since we have the decades, you must be aware of. So what is to plan 10 years of collaboration? Actually, what is to, to plan the decade? We, 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 what we were going to do in the next three, four years? The vision uh, to develop scientific knowledge, build infrastructure, and foster partnerships. You see, the, in the vision, you see partnerships for a sustainable and healthy ocean. The preparation phase, we evolve many phases until 2021. Uh, we need to get organized. Uh, so the, the international level is, is restructuring uh, and we want to engage very actively with this and creatively. You have Future Earth, a uh, major organization uh, out there uh, doing research, transdisciplinary research, or connecting several major international core projects that works uh, with different areas of sustainability, for instance, Ember, Future Earth Coast, Earth System Governance, this is solar surface ocean lower atmosphere uh, network. There. So there, the Future Earth is like an umbrella project for all of these, and these ones in the box are 
part of this knowledge action network uh, that Future Earth is proposing. It's an international network for action. Uh, and there are several uh, knowledge action networks. We say CANs, Ocean CAN is one of those. I'm part of the development team of the Ocean Can, and we are seeing Brazil as an opportunity for this type of work precisely because of uh, the, the issues that I addressed to you. So uh, in Brazil now, also civil society is organizing to produce uh, social control reports on the SDG 14 that speaks of oceans. Uh, so this was the, 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 the report of this year. And finally, we got money from Fundação Grupo Boticário. A project was approved, a four-year project, to, 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 like, to implement this vision that we're, we're talking about. And uh, Instituto Costa Brasilis, Oceanographic, Oceanographic Institute, are the producers or the carriers of this project but in the benefit of all networks. And uh, basically what we are going to do, annual synthesis reports entitled Brazilian Oceanic Horizon, okay, transforming the, the science to a more uh, palpable communication piece, but it's not only that. Uh, we do uh, cross self-diagnostics, uh, as the one we did before, integrated seminars in Brasilia, decentralized cross-network actions, so each network can do whatever, uh, continue to do its own work and we will support, uh, act as orchestrators. We will also uh, promote entrepreneurship for early career scientists and activists in Brasilia. So the idea is to know the, 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 the geography of power of Brasilia, the city, because there actually is where things are, have, have to be delivered on the ground and uh, across network governance mechanisms. So develop tools, instruments that can um, help us navigate uh, this complexity, the cross network, inter network activities and so forth. So very briefly. Okay guys, this, these are my conclusions, uh, our conclusions based on the paper. Uh, so we, we need to connect transformative actions into coherent narratives and test the advice derived from these theories and the theory of transformative agency is just one theory uh, of transformation that you can find out there. Uh, to promote regime shifts in ocean governance. You have to understand, uh, uh, describe visualize the, the, the monster in order to, to be able to critically uh, kill it. Uh, setting of more ambitious social mobilization targets, we need to get, uh, uh, this is like a mantra in environmental governance research that you need participation, blah, blah, blah. But you need projects to do that because it, cultural, Culturally speaking, uh, participation is not embodied in people's uh, eco political ecologies, at least in Brazil and places that I've visited. Eco-citizenship, stewardship, putting people to engage with the real world, get out of the bubble. Um, fostering orchestration of knowledge networks, considering this uh, complexity. Implement institutional learning experiments, very crucial to, to be structured on the process not only experiential knowledge, uh, learning, as I said, uh, is experimental learning is very critical. Support transformational trajectories, trajectories toward coevolutionary, polycentric, ecosystem, and area-based ocean governance systems. And as I said, pursue gradual, incremental, structured understanding of a given knowledge network field and that will vary according to the country that you are. Some country, countries are more permeable to this more democratic processes, networks. Uh, whereas in other countries you might find less uh, opportunity or uh, capability of doing this sort of work that we're doing uh, in, 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 in Brazil. So the, the, the idea is to catalyze transformative change. And with that, I close. If we have, or luckily, we have five minutes, ten minutes of discussions. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dragana, I'm from Serbia. 
And this was a question I, was meant, I wanted to ask for the previous presentation too, but it can be answered by you as well. Um, so you mentioned citizen science. Mm. And uh, my curiosity was, how big is citizen science in Brazil and in general in South America, if you know? Mm. Uh, because I think it's a very important mm, way to involve the, the citizens, the public, so. Thank you, thank yeah. You. Uh, so, <coughs> I, I wouldn't know, uh, I wouldn't know how it's uh, in South America, but I know that in Brazil, at least five ex examples that I could speak of, but we don't have a lot of time, but I, um, uh, I know that in University of Federal University of São Paulo here in Santos, Ronaldo Cristofoletti is working uh, with citizen scientship, citizen um, uh, science approaches. Uh, I know. That, well, I worked with Goliath Groupers. You know Goliath Groupers back in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2006, nine. We when uh, we started to have. Um, uh, Facebook and uh, well, I started with Facebook and more engaged with social media. We uh, we asked scuba divers to report on sightings of Goliath groupers, which are very endangered species, and then we published uh, two or three papers on the results of that. For manta rays, there are uh, uh, citizen science citizen science uh, stuff going on in uh, Parque. Parque da Laje de Santos for observations of underwater fishes. It's a very common approach. Um, you know anything you would like to contribute? Yeah, I wouldn't know yeah, I mean. how many or how developed they are. I know there's one global initiative, maybe you were part as well, that is a Reef Check. Yeah, that's. that's Reef perfect. Check, yeah. it's a global net uh, citizen science uh, approach. So I, I think it's, it's one of it. Uh, I know also some NGOs are trying to do this approach as well. So, for instance, the SOS Mata Atlantica Foundation has done observing the rivers. So they, uh, with the scientists, they developed a methodology where people could go to the rivers, get samples, and go through analysis to state about the state of river pollutions. So I don't know if the if anyone has ever made a review of how many initiatives we have. And here in our uh, lab at the Oceanographic Institute, we also have some initiatives on this type of projects, but I couldn't say how developed and how many we have in Latin America or Brazil. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Shala. Um, thank you very much. Here. I thank you because it was you that posted the information on this regarding these um, programs on Fisher Ed. That was where I found it before I, I could apply. Uh, that's one. F second, um, I've been a victim of uh, transdisciplinary research. Excuse me. Transdisciplinary research. Uh huh. Yeah, I actually was thrown out of my university because I have to, you know, feel it should be done this way. And um, so, I, I think I'm seeing hope. Um, thanks for that. And um, lastly, this picture is um, giving me some concern. When she spoke about um, the practice, she mentioned there is a particular goddess in the river or in the sea that you truth plot. Can you remember the name of the? Excuse, what the name? Yes. Huh? Yemanja. Interestingly, it's that syn name. Syncretized with uh, Virgin Mary and uh, other f feminine uh, uh, ideas of care and and yeah, uh, I'm surprised uh, because that name originated from my village. <laughs> <laughs> so that is what I'm surprised about. So yeah, yeah. So do you know the yeah. origin of yeah, this kind of practice? Excuse me, you're from Lagos. La yes, I'm from Lagos. Lagos. Yeah. yeah, in Lagos, actually, there is uh, the the largest uh, uh, community of uh, former uh, African slaves that came back home after. Uh, so, uh, some decades, so there are what five, six million uh, Nigerians that are uh, descendants from uh, people that were enslaved, and uh, of course there were there are a lot of interaction, uh, former historical interaction amongst our countries that probably that that's where where it came from. And actually, Emanja, the rhythm 
it's a, it's a very nice and, and, and melody also. <laughs> Thank you. Each, each, uh, each entity uh, has a different melody. Here. So for, for mangroves, for instance, the entity in mangroves is Nana Bodoke, which is, uh, <laughs> is the same also? Yeah. Ghana. So it's an uh, old lady, a uh, grandma, that also it's, uh, produces life and uh, nutritious. Uh, thanks for asking. Orisha, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Thais, I'm from Brazil, and Dragon asked about uh, citizen science, and I want to comment that uh, in our lab, we have uh, two initiatives working with that. One is mine, uh, which is about Bervigão. So we, oh, yeah. we get, uh, get people to take pictures wh whenever they see um, shells of Berbigo um, in, the, uh, in the sand. And also Yara. Is Yara here? Mm -hmm. She has a, a website where uh, she asks people to report um, wh wh what activities they do, uh, in which uh, which calls and beach, what they do, what is in there, like uh, um, uh, surfing, this kind of stuff. So yeah, that that but what you wanted to to, talk, to comment on. Thank you. Yeah, I think citizen science is uh, the way to go uh, to deal with this phenomena of Anthropocene and. Uh, getting information rapidly, uh, even if it's not much uh, rigor as you would uh, in a formal uh, science expedition, but uh, everyone produces knowledge. Uh, that's that's uh, something that uh, has to be very clearly uh, acknowledged in our scientific circles. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Adan from Mexico. Um, I, I want to ask in you, uh, what is your opinion about the barriers or wall institutional uh, to do transdisciplinary um, research? I mean, many scientists think that do research, tr transdisciplinary research is about make science with another scientists. And also many scientists think, oh, I don't believe in that because it's a diffuse thing and something like magical. So. Uh, I, I think um, we don't have uh, enough uh, financial support to do transdisciplinary research. So, um, right now, is the academy a real way to do transdisciplinary research? Uh, th th there, is, there are groups out there uh, in France, in many other countries, doing transdisciplinary research for many, many decades. That's, that's not, nothing new. Uh, as I showed you the, in the research action, which is transdisciplinary research, uh, it was in the 40s already, or people doing that. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what happens is that the silos and the, 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 um, uh, the, how can I say in English politely? <laughs> the, yeah, the, People want to get their niche and their 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 the power. Power. The concepts are power. Implies power. So if you tr bring different pro concepts, if you mix different concepts, then you get fusiness. The scientists don't feel uh, sometimes uh, 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 able to have a powerful relationship to be in a asymmetric position to have authority over an issue. So, and science don't, don't, don't like losing authority many times. Uh, so, but I, 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 I think, I would like to think that things are changing for the good in the terms that, as I said, that there are uh, calls being, uh, being available for, for us to come up and put up consortia or new projects. There are calls out there. They are very difficult to get still. Uh, the collaborative research action calls for from Belmont Forum, for instance. We've been engaged. I've been engaged with 
uh, designing three of these cars without success is a huge amount of effort. It's very competitive. We need more of this type of funding schemes uh, in Brazil, elsewhere, but also internationally. I think I think I touched your. You want may to I, add something? May I just add something? Um, I guess it's changing and we are part of the change, so we want to keep pushing for it. Uh, maybe in the developed countries, it's more developed than we have here. I don't know the situation in your country, but here in Brazil, we have some calls uh, from, uh, for funding, like the project I am affiliated now, it's, uh, I am doing on Oceanographic Institute, but the big project, the umbrella project, is from Environmental Science Institute. So myself and Luciana are working a project that is very transdisciplinary in a way that there are people from, uh, there are urban planners, uh, political scientists, um, social scientists, and uh, Mariani is also part of it. So it's a very transdisciplinary network to discuss environmental governance in a macro metropolis uh, area. So I think it's changing in other countries is much more developed. Um, so we have to keep pushing for it. Uh, here in Brazil, I think it's very difficult when we want to apply for a professor position in a university. Normally they want a scientific research in a very strict sense, but I think, I think this is also changing. So maybe when, if we keep pushing or working for it, the world will be more transdisciplinary and this will enable us to look to the complexity problem or like Leo put wicked problems in a more um, uh, complete uh, way. Thank you. So I'm um, Vitor from Brazil. And uh, first I would like to thank you guys to share your personal experience because uh, I myself uh, get very inspired by your both examples. Uh, and also, I wanted to ask you uh, if it is a, a major concern of those networks that you were talking about to support local communities about a ra uh, like regarding uh, raising the, their concerns about this this kind of issues that you were talking about. I, I was thinking about this, this Babi Tonga example you you were saying, and. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, like, what is the role of the organization uh, uh, in informing people about this issue? I, I want just to, to know your opinion. Yeah, the University of Joinville, which was the implementing, implementing body of the Bobby Tonga Chiba project, uh, when they accepted to be the taker of the resource from the public ministry, I, I don't think they ever they had a clue of what the project was all about. Uh, <laughs> sincerely, because it was incubated by networks, by collectives, like Coletivo Memorias do Mar, that one, one network in Santa Catarina State, and uh, the contribution of others that were thinking or and looking for a locus uh, organization, a folk organization to implement the project. But then now, uh, the university, it's uh, after three years and seeing that uh, it's it was a vigorous process of social mobilization, science-based mobilization. Uh, the project is being institutionalized, so uh, it has it has major it's ha it has had major impact on the university <coughs> mission or vision to connect to the to the territory, to the metropolitan area. So now it's it stands as a very important project in the suit of projects of extension projects, science extension projects that the university have. So, but originally, uh, I don't think it would ever be born one project within the university. You need different actors from outside to come sometimes and uh, bring inspiration or be, bring novel ideas. Uh, the silos are very, uh, uh, are well structured within many universities. I'm, I'm speaking broadly, of course, it's not uh, like that in every case, but, um, you, you need boundary organizations sometimes, this sort of organizations that connects different groups, um, brokers that can uh, uh, diffuse innovation. Hello, here. Hi. 
my name is Muhammad, and I am from Pakistan, actually. But I study here in University of Sao Paulo in the Department of uh, Geological Oceanography. So thank you for your talk. I want to ask the question to Leandra. So in the Brazilian sediments, uh, we find the uh, clues for the incident that happened in 1986 or 1985, that is Guyana incident, and we find uh, cesium clues that is radiogenic in the sediments. So since then, Brazil has made a lot of good measures on uh, to avoid these incidents again. So uh, we have a lot of uh, nuclear activities and nuclear tests in the world, and we find the clues in the sediments for them too. So is there any international convention that deals with the nuclear tests uh, related to ocean governance? Sorry, I wouldn't know to answer it properly. Maybe Alan knows better than me. We were just talking that probably ISA, the International Seabed Authority, has something related to that, or IMO, Mar Marpols, the, or Marpol that deals with pollution. But maybe Adam, Alan can, okay, can add thank you. more on that. I, I wouldn't know properly. It's much more important to look at the International Atomic Agen Energy Agency. Um, they have done a lot of work on this. Nuclear tests have largely been suspended under a uh, nuclear testing treaty, which has replaced practical tests with theoretical tests. The one country that is not involved in this is, of course, the People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. Um, mm. They are uh, or have been carrying out nuclear te tests of, of a practical nature. The last major test by one of the m more traditional nuclear powers was France in the Muroroa uh, Atoll in 1995, which caused a major outburst around the world. If you want to look at details of this, you'll find it in uh, Chapter 20 of World Ocean Assessment 1, which is largely based on work by the International Atomic Energy Agency, both in relation to naturally occurring radioactive material and uh, testing. I would recommend you to read that. It's about six or seven pages, and not too much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Uh, hi, um, I'm Natalia from Brazil. Uh, I would like to compliment Adam's uh, question about the walls from developing transdisciplinarity, because I had a experience in that in my master, where I analyzed um, drivers, opportunities, and barriers to integrated research for coastal management. And what we found is that there is lots of barriers uh, from bottom up as the top down um, structure. Like bottom up is uh, with the researchers want to do this kind of research because uh, it's more difficult. You have to go outside your, your comfortable zone and talk to others and learn new methodologies, new techniques, uh, basically talk to, to other person or other kind of research that you're not familiar with. Uh, but also, uh, at least in Brazil, we, uh, from the top down, we are not, uh, still are not, in the practice, are not fostering this kind of research because all the metrics that universities and funding agencies use to assess researchers are all disciplinary metrics, like uh, number of uh, papers, the impact factor of your paper, uh, this kind of thing that totally uh, f um, hinders transdisciplinarity because transdisciplinary research is costs more, you have to invest more time, uh, it's hard to have 
um, quantitative results. So in the practice, we are in Brazil still not, uh, not fostering this kind of research. So we have to push uh, towards uh, the changing of these metrics to assess our research. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ana from Brazil too. And uh, about the Babitonga example that you brought to us, like you said in the beginning, they didn't like uh, realize what should be or is going to be. And uh, I was wondering, like, uh, because you talk about uh, we need to communicate and how communicate, it's like uh, in that process, how did it ha happen? Like uh, to involve community or involve the stakeholders? Uh, how long does it take like to get people that uh, use the area or this kind of stuff like, and how they can get together to on one pro 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 proposal of the area and how that works, if it works? Yes, thank you for the, the question. Um, so basically, we had a variable opportunity, which was to design a project uh, with and picking a nice team, to picking the people that had the right expertise for a given uh, challenge within the project itself. That's, that was important. Sometimes within the public sphere, you don't have this flexibility to choose teams and to form groups that we work together in one single challenge for three, two, three years. So that was, that, that, that's the starting point. Uh, in the mobilization process, we had so a journalist involved, uh, an environmental educator involved, um, and we had different work packages with the project. One was uh, to, to mobilize uh, direct users, fishers, maricultures, uh, ports, uh, tourism, and so forth, and miners. Uh, so for, for these workshops, over 50 workshops, more than 300 direct users engaged in these workshops, more towards the marine spatial planning process. But we also had a, 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 a work package, uh, as I said, with uh, training for eco-citizenship eco with community leaders and um, teachers in, high, in, in schools, local schools. So also 100 hour many types of activities uh, related to eco-citizenship or stewardship. I, w I wouldn't know the translation in English of eco-citizenship. I think stewardship is what brings me more closer to, to this. So, and also we had saraus. How do I say sarau in English? We had in every single city a cultural concert, but which during the afternoon we had local uh, activities like dancing, local dances, traditional dances, uh, workshops, and in the afternoon uh, an open, open floor for local artists and then uh, professional artists performing. We had six, one, of the, in, one in every city, and then a final multicultural festival that was uh, just this past weekend uh, on Saturday and, and Sunday where we also got the indigenous groups together with the Quilombolas, African ascendants, trying to work with the uh, uh, immaterial as well as the material patrimony of, the, the, of, the, of this unity, which we are calling Babitonga ecosystem. Um, and yeah, the, so social media, videos, educommunication, uh, comunicação it's a very Latin approach for audiovisual, for um, media literacy promotion. So you get people to work in a, like a video, short video, and but they write the script, they film, they edit, they discuss the problem and produce the, that piece together. We had, I think we had, uh, we have uh, around 15. Uh, we have one of participants, <laughs> an edu comunicadora here in the in the room that took part of that. Uh, so yeah, different ways, different ways: phone, uh, f emails, uh, in-person visits are the most effective ways of sensitizing people. But also, we show there are many times where we uh, had everything prepared and uh, very few people showed up, or uh, even. Uh, no one showed up. 
politicians trying to um, to uh, pull up our carpets, waiting for the project to get over that sh that missile that you throw. They are accustomed to that, so they they okay. They clap, they support the project, but they're just waiting it to get over. But we, we could work towards that challenges as well, uh, because people felt part and felt their identity within the process. Uh, so the, the group Proba Bitonga now, it's autonomous. I, I don't even participate anymore. Uh, neither m the majority of my colleagues that were on the origin, original team. Finally, uh, in the first step, in the first thing that we did was co-design. So when we got the money, we got people together for four days in a reserved place uh, where everybody slept and we had the sessions during the day to plan the three years, the two years. And uh, for that I thank a lot the group of Christiana Seixas in Unicamp uh, who basically provided this, 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 the training, the necessary training, uh, the, the uh, participatory methodologies for that co-design to happen on the very early stage of implementation. That's crucial as well. Okay, we have one more question. Everybody's looking at me with a hungry, you know, angry and hungry and angry, angry face. Angry. So <laughs> please be very focused on your question and on the answers, okay? And Luis from Brazil. Um, despite all the collaboration of national and international researchers, Martin Weiss and Trindad was out our new MPA created. <laughs> so do you think that this um, approach from bottom to up can solve this kind of problem and how? Leandra is much more engaged with this problem. I can comment also, but she drove, the, she led the, the she was in the, t in the turmoil, <laughs> the center of the storm. We, we thought nobody would uh, bring the elephant in the room, but he did. <laughs> it's a joke, Could but. Um, perhaps explain a little bit more. Yeah, I will uh, just put the situation in a context very short, but. <laughs> so, long story short, uh, the both islands, it's uh, for the ones who doesn't know uh, Brazilian uh, national sea territory, Trindade and Martin Vaz, San Pedro and São Paulo are two of our archipelagos that are uh, far from the coast. It's our oceanic islands. Uh, for a while, we have many uh, scientific research collaborations in those areas, collecting information, doing research. So we have lots of scientific information about the areas. Most of scientific research we have there were sponsored by the uh, Brazilian government uh, funding agency. And all those scientific that were in the area uh, needed, uh, most of them, not all, but uh, needed the NAVE support because they are uh, oceanic areas. So the transport for the research in the area were uh, made by the Nave uh, shipping vessels. Uh, this year it was like, uh, it's called by the government as a, a window of opportunity where we had those uh, scientific knowledge. We had stakeholders up to promote the MPA creation and we have government willing to create the area. Of course it just comes in a wave uh, from international movement because all the countries, and I had a slide about this, but I decided to cut down because my time was short. But we had a wave of countries creating these large MPAs areas. So Chile, Mexico, US, UK, uh, France. And some of them were creating partnership with Navy. So those areas we have here, it's a Navy base as well to guarantee country sovereignty in those uh, offshore areas. So it was a very complex place. Uh, the government decided to create was a very quick uh, process uh, based on the previous process we have to create MPAs in Brazil. Uh, we try to uh, influence the process providing knowledge. So the Pinal Mar that Leo's showing in his presentation is a board of scientists that wrote a letter to the president saying, yes, protection for those archipelagos are very much necessary. The design of this marine protected area, it should be this one, right? So they send a letter with all the information. 
And of course, the government passed through lots of decision-making process. Along those process, at the end, the design of the areas is not really what science were claiming for. Some of the important spots for the biodiverse were left out, not all of them, but some of them. And also there are some criticism in terms of you have a big um, environmental protected area, which is not a no-take or a marine reserve, so how you are going to enforce so the idea is to enforce with this naive support in the area, but on the other hand, we have many information, and there is one, uh, it, it is a marine policy, right? A marine policy paper that was just published for, by some colleagues, like one month, maybe less, uh, about the, uh, how do I say, um, uh, fishery that we have in the area practiced by the Navy. And this fishery is not really regulated. So it's a conflict area. MPA was created, the conflict is not really solved yet. Government is committed to do um, a collective agreement that is pretty new in the governance, governance process for MPA creation process in Brazil, which is um, agreement between NAVE and ICMBio, which is our environmental uh, institute for creating protected areas, creating and implementing. And they have to publish this agreement probably in the next two, three uh, weeks, where they will say how they will deal with this elephant in their room, <laughs> how they will deal with this uh, fishery that is uh, made by NAVE and how they will deal with the stakeholders there. So I don't know, do you want to add something? Yeah, very briefly, Luciana. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the issue, the, the, the problem, um, the way I frame the, the, the problem is that, as such, uh, you have all these uh, area coverage targets in IC uh, yeah. 11 That's and that uh, was SDG 14, 5 and so forth, 10%, people are with 30%. So for me, it's more important uh, to know how to, how can we accelerate the process but on a principled based manner, uh, hearing people, uh, working with politics, the technical aspects, how can you accelerate but considering this, this aspect rather than just uh, reaching the target itself. So to, I think there, there's a paper by Ratana, Chupanji and others which is called the, the inception of marine protected areas worldwide, the step zero process. It's crucial because uh, you, 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 the heritage that the process will leave for implementation sometimes, it's more trouble. People are even, they like each other less <laughs> after the process <laughs> and have more conflicts created. So uh, what's the usefulness of this for conservation? Uh, some, some people, when I say that, think that, oh, you're not conservation. But of course we want, uh, Jake, Jake Rice says, we need 100% of oceans governed, area-based governed, protected, not only 10%. So it's 100% of the oceans should be governed through area-based percent. This is, so this is, th there is a distraction with this numerical quantitative targets of the real issue of how to accelerate considering social aspect, political and technical institutional aspects. That's a question for social scientists to answer as well as experts uh, everywhere. Uh, so and I'll in terms of uh, research uh, interest, if uh, in of any of you are interested, there's a, um, a very new book uh, published by the MIT Press, which is um, Sustainable goals. Uh, not, what's the name? Is uh, I have the book, but I just say uh, it's uh, governing governing through goals, and the debate of the book. I can send the full reference. Uh, is a uh, if the goals are really adding something in terms of effectiveness for the governance? Because sometimes we just establish the goals, ten percent to twenty percent, and. Uh, if we achieve, or in case of Brazil, we just double the target, is this really adding something to marine conservation? So uh, it's a very interesting approach if you are interested on this kind thank of topic. You. Okay, so thank you everybody. Thank you, Leandra <laughs> and Leopoldo. <laughs>